Meanwhile, uh, Sherry, where are you located? I'm in Santa Rosa, California. Oh, great. Good. And about, uh, about 30 minutes from me. Mm -hmm. Oh, cool. And Harsha, are you still on? Yes, yes, I am. And where are you coming from? Uh, from India. Oh, great. Well, I'm, I'm glad you made this work. It's, uh, we're having technical trouble over here, but, <laughs> but it's good to have you with us. Swati, are you still with us? Uh, yes, I am. So okay. we both are from uh, Delhi, India. New Delhi. Ah, you're from Delhi. Okay. Yes. Um, and your your batch mates in the same school? Yes, we're doing uh, PhD. Like we have PhD batch mates uh, in University of uh, Delhi right now. Oh, okay. that's great. Sure. And, and is it, are you uh, aiming to be analysts later on or what? Uh, uh, hopefully, yes, um, because our PhDs are also in line with the union works. Uh -huh. And um, we've had like some exposure to the union work. So, yeah. So becoming an analyst is like the eventual goal. Mm -hmm. So we're trying our best. Okay, to gather great. all the knowledge That's we terrific. can. Wonderful. <laughs> okay, well, this will be a good one. And we do have a few more people coming in uh, now. And uh, so, uh, t Tim, do you want to uh, introduce the session? And uh, I'll, I'm going to keep my mouth shut because I'm... I can't see what's going on, so. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, I'd be happy to. And um, this is another session that, that is going to feature John Jackson, who's been sharing with us Jungian uh, perspectives on the Old Testament. And we've done a few sessions with this theme, and John has done just incredible I think wonderfully fascinating work on on different aspects of the Old Testament. So he did one on Exodus, he did one on the the women in the Old Testament. And remind us again today what you're gonna focus on, John. It's part two of women in the Old Testament. Great. Last so, time we got uh, we got through Genesis and we'll pick up and move forward from there. Terrific. Um, and we've got people on from all over the world, so it's, it's, yeah. this, is, this is such a cool format uh, to be able to include all these people with different life stories and perspectives. Um, so we have Joss, who's coming to us from uh, Hawaii. And Hi, everybody. Aloha. Hi, Aloha. Josh. Hi, John. Hi. Looking, looking, looking forward to your, yeah, your fascinating lecture again. Yeah. We've got and, a few people in California, and Miles is in uh, Canada. I'm in, I'm in Montana, which is northwestern U.S. So... Unless anybody has anything else to say in terms of introduction, let's turn it over to John. Yeah, I'm just reading uh, in the chat box, Maxie Farrington put up a quote from Carl Jung from the Visions Seminar. We must read the Bible or we shall not understand psychology. Our psychology, whole lives, our language and imagery are built upon the Bible. I think that's certainly true for Western culture. Yes. These stories are so deep and so powerful. Um, um, that's all I can say about it. <laughs> um, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. Can everybody see that? Yes. Okay. So uh, this is from my series of 10 lectures, uh, The Psychological Approach to the Old Testament. And looking at women in the Bible, and as I just said uh, last time, we got all the way through Genesis, um, and now we're moving into Exodus and uh, beyond. 
But first, um, an interesting little bit of uh, history, 700 years before rabbinical marriage laws, early Jewish marriage contracts were based on Egyptian models. If a man wanted to divorce his wife, he could do that, but the divorce money was on his head, and vice versa. If the woman wanted to divorce the man, she could, but the money would be on her head, the cost of it. Her possessions would be described, and basically it was a no-fault divorce. Kind of interesting that long ago um, that women had equal status as far as marriage law was concerned. So if we move into the book of Exodus, um, the first woman really uh, to come up is Miriam. Um, well, actually, the, the midwives were the first women to come up uh, because they conspired against the Pharaoh um, to not kill the Hebrew babies. Um, Miriam was the older sister of Moses and of Aaron. The, uh, it was a family. The Torah names her as one of the seven major female prophets of Israel. And she enters the story very early, even though she's not named. Uh, tradition says that this sister of Moses is in fact Miriam. Um, when he was hidden and then he was put in the, the ark, the basket, uh, in the reeds, his sister stationed herself at a distance to see what would be done to him. And as we know, Pharaoh's daughter came down to bathe in the Nile. Um, and it maybe wasn't just a regular bath, it may have been a ritual bath of some sort, but she discovers the baby and decides to uh, keep him. Tradition says that she tried to suckle him uh, herself, but couldn't. And then Moses' sister, Miriam, says to her, shall I go and summon a nursing woman from the Hebrews that she may suckle the child for you? And of course, it was Moses' mother that uh, raised him in the uh, royal house. The interesting thing about this is that at least, you know, usually when uh, in the Old Testament, when something is not mentioned, it means nothing happened. Uh, no one told her to do this. She just went and did it. And everyone else basically had given up. I mean, this is, you know, annihilation. This is a mass slaughter of the Hebrew males. But it's not happening because of the women. And she, Miriam, goes down to the river, to the Nile. And this is the beginning of the Hebrews' liberation. So Exodus. when begins. you say everybody else had given up, do you mean... In the face of the power of the yes. Egyptians? I see, okay. Yeah, in terms of what Pharaoh was doing, yeah. But the women, the midwives, and Moses' sister, Miriam, stood up to this and caused something different to happen. And therefore, we have Moses who lived, and it was because of the women, the acts of the women. So, interesting question. And uh, this comes from Dr. Ashkenazi. Um, who led the Hebrews out of Egypt? We all, well, you can say yes, it was God. Um, but also we could say it was Moses, but that's not completely true. It's only one third of the truth. As it says in Micah, listen to what the Lord says. I brought you up out of Egypt and redeemed you from the land of slavery. I sent Moses to lead you, also Aaron and Miriam. So it was the three. It was the brother, the two brothers and the sister. And after they, you know, the, the song of the, well, after crossing the Sea of Reeds or the Red Sea, Pharaoh's army is destroyed. Miriam leads the Israelite women in the song of the sea. And they sing, they dance, and they play drums. This is, uh, the Song of the Sea is actually an ancient, 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 ancient poem. It's probably one of the oldest things in the Bible, and it was incorporated here. Um, and it's one of two things. We'll, we'll come across the other one in just a moment. Now, Miriam and her brother Aaron uh, also are 
mentioned as in the book of Numbers as criticizing Moses because of his Cushite wife. Tradition says that she was Ethiopian. Um, and uh, some interpretations of the story uh, say that they were criticizing his foreign wife, his black wife. Um, but it's not clear if this was Zipporah. It might have been a second wife. And the thing that they were uh, criticizing him for was that he wasn't having sex with her anymore, according to rabbinical teachings. Um, and they thought that this was improper, that she, Cushite is a, is a term that's used in the Old Testament to mean something special. Um, the Israelites are sometimes referred to as Cushite um, because they're special in the eyes of God. Um, so they were, uh, according to tradition, um, not in the Bible, the thing that they were criticizing him for was that he was being celibate, probably because he was a prophet. God did not like this plan and uh, punished Miriam um, with leprosy, according to Numbers 12.10. The Lord's wrath flared against them, and Miriam was blanched as snow. It was just a temporary thing, but it was a punishment for criticizing Moses. Miriam is associated with water. Um, her brother Aaron was associated with clouds of glory. Moses, her brother, was associated with manna, the food that appeared every morning on the ground um, in the wilderness. But Miriam is water. It's partly because of the Red Sea, the parting of the Red Sea, and then it's also because of the well of Miriam. And when she died in Kadesh, in Numbers 20, the well went dry, um, or maybe it was already dry, we're not sure, but tradition says that when she died, the water died, basically. So, and this is why in the Passover celebration, sometimes there's a glass of water on the table um, in memory of Miriam. Not just Elijah, but also Miriam. So, still in the, uh, in the story of the Exodus, uh, the daughters of Zelophehad, it's an interesting story. It's very brief, um, but it actually appears three times in the Hebrew Bible from three different sources. So it does have some importance. And what happened was that these four or five daughters of Zelophehad, their father died. And the law at the time was that only males could inherit. Um, so they went to Moses. Moses took it to God, and in this uh, source, it's God, it's not Yahweh, it's Adonai. And God says, yes, of course, women can inherit if there's no son, and let this be a law for all generations. So there's another story in the Old Testament of women changing history, changing the laws. Um, and as long as there's no son, women can inherit. Again, at the end of the Exodus story, um, once again, spies are sent into the, the Promised Land, and we run into a woman named Rahab. Now, Rahab uh, traditionally is a prostitute, and there's probably more to it than that, but it says, and Joshua, son of Nun, Joshua was Moses' uh, heir, the new leader of Israel, he sent two men in secret as spies from Shittim, saying, go see the land and Jericho. And they went, and they came to the house of a whore woman, whose name was Rahab, and they slept there. It, and it was said to the king of Jericho, saying, look, men of the Israelites have come here tonight to search out the land. So, the Israelites are about to enter um, the promised land. This is the beginning of 
the uh, story of the of Jericho, the fall of Jericho. Um, Ahab was probably an innkeeper, um, may have also been a prostitute, but the question is what kind of prostitute? And like essentially all stories of actual prostitutes in the Bible, she's treated with honor and respect. Um, so was she a prostitute, just a simple prostitute or a temple prostitute, a religious prostitute? It's not clear. But in any event, the men take refuge in the world of women. Um, another story of, in which prostitutes are honored is the story of Solomon and uh, the two women that came to him, each claiming that the child was theirs, and he said, I'll just cut the child in half. Well, both of those women were prostitutes, and he listened to their story, he thought about it, he came up with the solution, he gave them respect. So in the Old Testament, um, later, in the later writings, particularly, um, the idea of being a prostitute becomes a bad thing. Israel is considered a prostitute because they worship other gods, because they abandoned Yahweh. Um, but that's not true in the early, it's not true in terms of actual women who were actually prostitutes. Um, they weren't judged in that way. Um, in the John, early mm -hmm. yes. John, can I ask a question? Mm -hmm. Can you define prostitute in um, that time and period, because I'm a little confused. Um, well, here we have the, the definition of prostitute is, you know, like paid women for yes. service. Whereas the, there, they use simple and temple, and they're given a sense of elevation. Um, basically, I think what it, it, to be a temple prostitute basically means that she followed a different religion. She worshiped a different God. Um, and they would have annual, at least, if not more frequent, uh, religious services in which uh, sex was part of it. Um, often sex with the king or sex with an important figure or whatnot, but it was part of the religious, it was part of religious worship. Uh, it didn't happen every day. Um, it was a special kind of thing and it was a special kind of status that one had. I don't know if that answers your question. Uh, yes, I think uh, um, they probably had a different terminology for that. We're using, again, it's all labels and yes. uh, we're getting a little bit confused because we're now in a different time. Yeah. And, uh, so that had a different meaning and uh, purpose. Yeah, the, the word prostitute carries a heavy meaning, a burden in this culture, you're right. Correct. Yeah. I would just add, I put in the chat this book by Nancy Qualls Corbett on the sacred prostitute, which uh -huh. gives a great detail on the, the role of the temple prostitute in the yeah. goddess religions, which I think is absolutely fascinating. It's yeah. very different from what we think of as a prostitute normally. It's in the story of Gilgamesh, and uh, it's, uh, you know, if you read uh, Mary Renault's stories uh, about ancient, you know, the ancient uh, Mediterranean. Um, you'll find it in there as well. Uh, thank you for that, uh, that link, Jim. So uh, Rahab only shows up for a moment or so in the Old Testament, but it's significant because she's an outsider. She worships a different God, a different religion, but she's heard the story of the Israelites coming across the Red Sea. That's what makes this important. She knows that that God must be the one true God. That's why she does this and decides to save these two men. She even uh, lies to the king or the soldiers of the king and says, I don't know, they were here, but they left. They must have gone out the wall. But meanwhile, she's got them hidden up on the roof under some straw. She asks that she and her family be spared when the city is invaded, which is exactly what happens. The spies tell her to mark her home by hanging a red cord out of the window when the Israelites return. So basically, it's a kind of Passover. Again, it's a red mark outside saying, please pass over this house when you destroy everything else, which is exactly what happened. 
if you remember the story of uh, the sun standing still for a day and the walls falling. The walls came a tumbling down, but you see the red, you see the red cord and uh, Rahab and her family are the only survivors. So Rahab is actually identified as an ancestor of King David. And in the New Testament, she's identified, therefore, as an ancestor of Jesus, as are Ruth, Tamar, and Bathsheba. It's interesting how, how often the women in the Old Testament are outsiders, actually. They're foreign women, um, not Hebrews. Uh, it comes in many times. So, moving a little bit forward um, to Deborah and the time of the judges, uh, when Israel was first a nation, if you know the story, uh, God did not want them to have a king. Um, and so they were ruled in a very different way. There were judges, they're not judges in the sense uh, that we think of them necessarily, but um, they were people who ruled on matters. Uh, it was more personal, not legal as such. Um, and the actual uh, power was more in the hands of the religious leaders, uh, particularly the prophets. The Book of Judges mentions 11 leaders by name who are said to be judges or to judge Israel. Each one came from a different tribe. So um, the tribes of uh, Israel, but only one of them was a woman and that's Deborah. Um, the only other name you probably recognize, uh, way down at the bottom, you'll see that one of the judges was Samson, of Samson and Deliah. So the judges uh, were before the monarchy, and uh, according to the story, uh, God reluctantly allowed them to have a king later on because they demanded it. But that's not the original plan. That wasn't the plan in terms of how God wanted the country to be ruled. The judges lasted about 400 years, and it was a kind of non-hereditary leadership, but most likely uh, they were chosen from the leaders of the fighting and the landed and the ruling aristocracy uh, in Israel. So most likely they were a, 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 you know, a select few. Uh, that were chosen from. And as I said, uh, the religious leaders were the ones that were actually really in control at that time before there was a king. The Deborah was a prophetess. She was a judge and a warrior. And the only other person that's mentioned in the Old Testament as being a prophet and a judge was Samuel, the prophet Samuel, who uh, was the thorn in the side of King Saul and the uh, one that selected David as the uh, next king. As a prophet, Deborah did not offer sacrifices because women couldn't be priests, uh, but she did lead services and she did preach. And she's known for sitting under the palm of Deborah in Ephraim. The Israelites would come to her and she would rule. Uh, regarding their disputes. Very powerful, very important woman, the only judge that was a woman in that time. Now, interesting story. Um, this is, they're, they're still at war with the Canaanites. Uh, and Deborah tells a particular Israelite warrior, Barak, to take 10,000 troops to Mount Tabor and attack the Canaanite uh, commander, that's Sisera. And he said to her, well, I'll go if you do. And she says, well, okay. And then she said, prophetically, in the hand of a woman, the Lord will deliver Sisera. And as it turned out, it wasn't Deborah, it was Jael, the wife of a clan leader, who took Sisera in as he was uh, probably 
trying to escape and gave him water and rest and then put a tent peg through his head. Uh, and that is the uh, another story. That's another uh, bit of history of the women in the Old Testament. These women were not subservient and they were not small. The Song of Deborah, again, as with Miriam's Song of the Sea, it's an old, 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 old poem um, that's been incorporated uh, into the Hebrew Bible. Probably uh, those two poems are probably the oldest documents, the oldest things that are in the uh, Hebrew Bible. And it celebrates Israel's victory over the Canaanites. Once again, <laughs> um, another story along the same lines, Judith in the Bible. Judith is known for criticizing her fellow Jews for not trusting God to save them from Assyria. So this is old, this is an old story. She goes with her slave to the camp of the en enemy uh, general, Holofernes, and uh, she ingratiates herself with him, promises to work for him as a spy, and somehow she gets into his tent at night and he's in a drunken stupor, and she cuts off his head. And because of that, the Assyrians leave and Israel is saved. So, once again, not a small woman who changes history. Shrinking violets they were not. <laughs> Right. Now, the book of Judith is not included in the Hebrew Bible or the uh, Protestant Bible. It's only in the, uh, the Catholic uh, uh, Bible uh, as part of the Apocrypha. But it's an interesting story, and it's a powerful story along the same lines of what we've been talking about. In the Greek, the original, the oldest text that we have of this one, um, there are a number of historical anachronisms. Um, which clearly, you know, it, the story couldn't have happened when it did because the descriptions are of later. We said that also about the book of Exodus. Um, but people, uh, scholars now think that Judith uh, is actually a book of fiction, basically a, a, a theological tale or a parable. It's um, probably one of the oldest examples we have of a novel or a short story. Another story. Mm -hmm. Yes. Excuse me. Could you uh, could you tell me uh, clarify what you mean by the Catholic Bible? Um, uh, if you look at uh, what's considered to be the Old Testament, um, there are three different uh, versions of it. There's uh, the Hebrew Bible, there's the Protestant Bible, and then there's the uh, uh, Catholic Bible, which is, they all have different books in them. Uh, they, they, they agree on the certain core material, but um, there are in the Hebrew Bible and in the Catholic Bible, there are additional books uh, which are considered apocryphal, but um, are given validity um, in, in the Catholic faith. Uh, they, they accept them as being scripture, basically. Yeah. Ed Edward Edinger um, used to refer to this book, the Jerusalem Bible, as the Catholic Bible, I think. Yes. Yeah. And I just I, grabbed it off my shelf, and it does have the book of Judith in it. Yes, yes. Yeah, the Jerusalem Bible. It's a good, it's a good translation, as English translations go. Uh, yeah, the, the Jerusalem Bible has the best annotations that I've seen, actually. Yeah. So, moving a little bit forward, but uh, still in the, uh, the, the same era of ancient Israel, uh, the story of Esther. Um, Esther becomes queen, and this is during the time of Persia, which means it's uh, after the time of, uh, it's after the time of the Babylonian captivity. Uh, because Babylon is now gone and Persia is, uh, is, rule, is king, is ruling. Um, and it's another example of the fact that, uh, you know, when 
people were when all the when the Jews were released from Babylon, not all of them went back. Um, likewise, not you know uh, when the Jews left Egypt, not all of the Jews left. I mean, there was a huge Jewish uh, colony or, or, or in uh, Alexandria um, many years later. Um, so um, this is actually um, in Persia. Esther is uh, a handmaiden or uh, a concubine or um, who knows what, but she becomes queen uh, because uh, the king's wife, Vashti, refused to uh, come and uh, perform, basically. Uh, wouldn't obey the king's commands. Uh, so she's banished. And uh, because, Esther, because Esther is so beautiful, she's chosen uh, to replace her. And she, she now keeps the Jewish identity secret, um, but she becomes a queen in Persia. She spends uh, one night with the king, which is how she gets selected. Um, and once again, it's because of her great beauty. That's what's said. She prevents a massacre of the Jews. Um, so this is another story uh, along very familiar lines um, in which uh, the king's, uh, one of the king's vassals uh, decides he's going to kill all of the Jews because a particular Jew, Mordecai, uh, has offended him and would not bow down to him. Um, but Esther prevents this, and she prevents it reluctantly at first, but she goes to the king unsummoned, which means she could be put to death just for doing that. But he sees her, which probably had been, you know, apparently she'd fallen out of favor. She wasn't the favorite uh, queen anymore, but she goes unsummoned, and she charms him for three days. I'll give, grant you any wish that you want. Well, let's put on a banquet. I'll grant you any wish. Let's put on a banquet. Um, and she then calls out um, her enemy, and um, he is uh, the man that uh, ordered the death of the Jews, who's Ousted. But you see, the, the order of the king can't be undone. Um, the order is out. The Jews are going to be killed. So what he does is he orders another, another proclamation that the Jews can arm themselves against their enemies, which they do. And uh, people that wanted to kill them end up getting killed. And that's because of Esther, who becomes the queen in Persia. So Mordecai, who's her cousin, is promoted to Grand Vizier, and basically that means that she and uh, Mordecai are now in her. Interesting story. The other interesting thing, uh, this is a later uh, book in the Bible. This is the one book of the Bible, really, that God is not mentioned. Um, and when, uh, when she's deciding whether or not to go to the king, uh, she asks all the people to fast. But there's no mention of prayer even um, in the book of Esther. It's interesting. Uh, and yet it is considered uh, scripture. Now, the most wicked woman in the Bible, Jezebel. So I asked uh, last time in the introduction uh, when we talked about uh, feminist uh, interpretations of stories um, and the intersectional versions of stories, uh, how much of what happened to, is, uh, to Jezebel was because she was a woman? How much because she was born an immigrant? How much because she was black? We have to ask those questions. The most wicked woman in the Bible. So Jezebel was a Phoenician, the arch enemies of the time of Israel. Um, she was the wife of King Ahab of the Omri uh, dynasty. So this is early on. Um, uh, well, it's after David and it's after Solomon. 
she was the great aunt, according to tradition, of Dido, the queen of Carthage. So Ahab, and this is what happened in the Northern Kingdom, and this is, uh, you know, in the later writings, this is why the Northern Kingdom fell, because they abandoned uh, Yahweh, they abandoned the uh, monotheism. Ahab built a house of Baal uh, in the Northern Kingdom. And Jezebel became a priestess of Asherah, the great mother goddess. So she becomes a temple prostitute, a religious prostitute. It's a different religion. It's a different way of worship. And this is what's going on up north of Jerusalem. So Jezebel, from her position of power, has all of the prophets of Yahweh violently killed and purged from the Northern Kingdom, and maybe a hundred survivors, something like that. And Yahweh's altars were torn down. So it really was an apostrophe. Uh, it, it really was uh, an abandonment of the Jewish religion. Uh, some traditions say that uh, there was a golden calf, again, that was built way up north um, as one of the altars. Jim, what was the book of the Bible that uh, Jezebel appears in? Mm. You know, I am not sure right at the moment. Could I, maybe Numbers? Or uh, no, maybe it was uh, the book of Kings, one, one or two. I'm not sure which one it is. It's also referred to in the book of Revelations. Yes, right. At more as a metaphor, but... Yes, uh -huh. Could, you, could I also ask, uh, Dr. Jung wrote uh, in um, his, his collected work, Ion, about Miriam and Moses. Mm -hmm. And he, he developed four quaternities. And he referred to uh, Miriam as being an anima figure right. for Moses. And so um, from the perspective of depth psychology, could you... Tell us something about the relationship between Moses and Jethro, who is considered a, an archetype of the wise old man and Miriam. Well, Jethro, um, uh, Jethro was the father, right? Um, I, I'm somehow blanking on this at the moment, but uh, Miriam as an anima figure is interesting. Um, Particularly now, if you, uh, if you uh, like John Beebe, you know, who's, who considers himself a post-Jungian and what he has to say about the anima, um, the, the anima evolves and we see it differently now than uh, people used to. Um, we experience it differently now. Um, the anima, I think it was in uh, this session here when John Beebe came to be with this group, uh, that he said that the anima uh, is experienced sometimes as uh, regret or anger or resentment because of not being more famous or successful or not getting what it is that we feel we deserve, um, that that is an anima experience. Uh, from the unconscious, um, and we need to uh, deal with that. I don't, this isn't a direct answer to the question you asked, but this is my new understanding, actually, of the anima. Uh, Dr. Dr. Jung referred to uh, uh, Miriam as being a prophetess, and yeah. also as, a, as an archetype of the great mother, but he specifically points out that she became an anima figure to Moses when she became incensed over Moses taking the Ethiopian woman as a wife. Yes, right. And so I, 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 I was trying to discern, uh, first of all, uh, how it was that Miriam was an anima figure and what it was about taking the Ethiopian woman as a wife mm -hmm. that would that's, be uh, an anima figure. Now, that's, that's interesting. And, you know, the, the whole concept of the anima um, in terms of Jung's model of the psyche um, 
Jung actually developed the idea of the anima before he developed the idea of the shadow. Um, so in his early descriptions of the anima, it, there's very much a shadowy kind of aspect to uh, the feminine image, um, which I think later gets separated out. Um, and probably it's somewhere along those lines. I, I'm not sure. But it's a confusing, uh, it's a confusing image to me. And it's, it's, it's a, there's a number of things in medicine as a doctor that the more I study them, the less I understand them, like the thyroid gland and how it actually works. And this is another example. But the anima, psychologically, the more I study it, the more I look at it, the more I know about it, the less I understand it. It's, it's, it's confusing. The anima, animus. Um, and of course, nowadays, you know, the thinking is that we all, every one of us, male and female, have an anima and an animus within us. It's not yes, just... Doc, Dr. Jung acknowledged that. Yeah. But also in uh, Mysterium Conjunctionis, which was one of his last great works late in life, yeah. remains consistent on his view of the anima because he, he writes a 46-page essay on, on Adam and Eve yeah. and citing uh, not uh, just purely dry historical knowledge or what's perceived as historical knowledge, yeah. uh, but as Adam and Eve and the, and the characters and places surrounding them as being psychological realities yeah. and their relationships. And uh, that is uh, what I was interested in. Yeah, okay, yeah. Uh, my profound experience with the Mysterium um, is when I finally came to understand a while back uh, about Jung, uh, Jung's nonverbal psychology, the psychology of images. Um, and the Mysterium is so rich in that. And um, I really recommend that you read the Mysterium with Edinger's book uh, in your hand, uh, because he's got all the images that are being referred to. And it's profound. It's very deep. <laughs> it's, uh, it's, it's mind boggling. I have, I, I have to put it down and let images absorb for a while before I continue when I do that. Okay. So Jezebel, uh, is up against the prophet Elijah. Elijah uh, holds a contest. Uh, all of the prophets of Baal and Asherah, uh, these apostate uh, prophets, uh, go up against Elijah, and you know, each one of them has a an altar, and which you know what God is going to make the altar burst into flame, and it's Elijah that uh, wins that contest, and he has all of them, 950 of them, killed when he wins the contest. The people turn against uh, the, uh, the, the false prophets. But Elijah has to run for his life uh, because Jezebel is out to get him, basically. So, Jezebel then uh, conspires to frame an innocent man uh, so her husband can inherit his property. The man is, in fact, executed, and Elijah shows up out of nowhere and condemns Ahab and Jezebel. Um, it's actually, uh, you know, this is a real, this is, this is a real crime. Uh, you can say what you will about uh, killing all the prophets or killing all of the, uh, uh, the, the followers of Yahweh. Uh, this is a real crime, and it's actually very much like the crime that David committed with uh, Bathsheba, uh, having Uriah killed falsely. So three years later, Ahab is killed. And the prophet Elisha, who is Elijah's replacement, has Jehu anointed as king. Jehu kills the heirs, Ahab's son and nephew. And then he goes and confronts Jezebel. 
And the story is that she calmly puts on her makeup and her fine clothes and she taunts him from a balcony. So some interpretations of the story uh, uh, in a very negative sense uh, interpret this as being prostitute behavior, but she probably was a temple prostitute. Uh, and as I say, that wasn't everyday behavior. She's taunting him uh, from a position of power. But her slaves, her eunuch slaves, uh, side with the general and uh, they throw her out of the window. Jehu tramples her with his horse and her body is then eaten by dogs as prophesied by Elijah. Jezebel's history is written describing her as being a false prophet and sexually promiscuous. Um, the suggestion was that she's a temple prostitute, as I said. Um, so we have to understand the difference there. Abandoned Yahweh. They abandoned the, uh, the faith in Yahweh. They abandoned the monotheistic. So the last two women that I want to talk about um, in this lecture uh, are um, metaphorical women. Um, and uh, Song of Songs is uh, particularly one that's really wonderful, um, probably from the time of Solomon. Um, and it's written from the point of view of a woman. Um, in the Bible, also called the Song of Solomon. I'll just read it to you here. Let me kiss with the kisses of his mouth, for your loving is better than wine. For fragrance, your oils are goodly, poured oil is your name, and so the young women love you. Draw me after you, let us run. The king has brought me to his chamber. Let us be glad and rejoice in you. Let us extol your loving beyond wine. Rightly do they love you. While the king was on his couch, my nard gave off its scent. A sachet of myrrh is my lover to me all night between my breasts. I am the rose of Sharon, the lily of the valley. Like a lily among thorns, so is my friend among the young women. Hark, oh, my lover is coming, bounding over the mountains, leaping over the hills. My lover is like a deer or like a stag. Oh, he stands behind our wall, peering through the windows, peeping through the crannies. My lover spoke out to me, arise, my friend, my fair one, go, for look, the winter has passed, the rain has gone away. That is a beautiful bit of poetry, really at the core of what's beautiful in the Old Testament, I think. In the book of Proverbs, uh, we have another woman all together. Uh, Proverbs, uh, it's actually very, it's from the wisdom literature, and um, this was an ancient, ancient, ancient custom all through the Middle East. Egypt was particularly well-developed, uh, where the Hebrews were for a long time, um, and elsewhere around in the Mediterranean area. Um, probably reached its final form after the Babylonian exile, which is probably true of most of the Old Testament. Much of Proverbs is presented as advice for sons. Um, so it's not particularly um, directed at women, but there's a very important woman in Proverbs, which is Sophia. Sophia is uh, portrayed as uh, the wisdom of God, or the wisdom of God is portrayed as a woman, as Sophia. She was, according to uh, what she says, created before all other created things. She assisted 
in the ordering of the universe. And uh, this is the picture that we talked about in this group before um, of God creating Adam. And who is it that's, he's got his left arm around Sophia. Proverbs 8, 3 to 6, you, to you, men, I call out in my voice to humankind. Understand shrewdness, you dupes and fools. Make your heart understand. Listen, for I speak noble things. For wisdom is better than rubies. All precious things can't match her worth. I, wisdom, dwell in shrewdness and cunning knowledge, I find. Fear of the Lord is hating evil, pride, haughtiness, an evil way, and perverse speech do I hate. When there were no deeps, I was spawned. When there were no wellsprings, water sources, before the mountains were anchored down, before hills, I was spawned. He had yet not made earth and open land and the world's first clods of soil. When he founded the heavens, I was there. When he traced a circle on the face of the deep, when he propped up the skies above, when he powered the springs of the deep, when he set to the sea its limit, that the waters not flout his command, when he strengthened the earth's foundations, and I was by him and intimate, I was his delight day after day, playing before him at all times, playing in the world, his earth and my delight with humankind. That's pretty cool. <laughs> that is really amazing. Every time I read that and the Song of Songs, the beauty of the poetry uh, is just stunning. I mean, just absolutely stunning. And that is what I have to present. That is the end of my presentation for today. Thank you, John. That's fascinating as always. We, we talked about the three versions of the Old Testament. Mm -hmm. um, the Hebrew Bible, the Jerusalem Bible, and what's the third one? Well, the, there's the Hebrew Bible, there's the Protestant Bible, which is what we normally think of as the Bible um, in our culture. And then there's the Catholic. Uh, version. So the, um, the Protestant Bible is just the Bi the Old Testament without the Apocrypha? Yeah, right, basically. Yeah. And the Hebrew Bible contains a few additional books as well. Um, but the uh, when, we, when we talk about the Apocrypha, we're talking about the additions in the Catholic version, right? <clears throat> the, the Latin version, basically. Yeah, it's fascinating to see uh, what was omitted by the Protestant Bible. <laughs> and uh, as I've said before, it was John that pointed out to me that Sophia was, uh, had God's arm around her in Michelangelo's painting because I never saw that before John mentioned it. And I think it's because in Protestant churches or Protestant way of thinking about it, they they write Sophia out, and and uh, it wasn't until I read Edinger that I found uh, Proverbs eight, um, you know, which is the segment that John read there. Uh, but you know, if there if there's anything that speaks for the for the equality of women and women being at the center of the action, it's that, and. Uh, you know, I was talking about this one day in my group, and uh, Bill, my friend Bill, said, well, that's what philosophy means. Philo means love, and Sophie <laughs> means Sophia. Yes, <laughs> <laughs> that is so true. Wow. With, with, which I, I had never consciously noticed either. Mm -hmm. So so somehow the Western tradition, and particularly the the Calvinist tradition, has written uh, Sophia out of the 
out of the uh, equation. And, uh, but, you know, psychologically, the wisdom of God is a woman. Right. <laughs> That's what's clearly said here. Yes. I, I, I mean, I, I don't know, you know, uh, Tim, what would, what would Steve say about this? I mean, would, would he acknowledge the, uh, the, that Proverbs or they just turn their back on it? Yeah, I think uh, my, my brother and a lot of uh, more liberal religious people say that that there's a lot of feminine energy that that doesn't come out in the in the modern translations uh the king james or the, even the, the revived revised standard version and so much of the old testament uh references to god are are either gender neutral or they're more feminine but the way they've been translated Partly because because English doesn't have any kind of uh, usable pronoun for either or. Um, all of the translations talk about the, the male aspect of God, and yet there's all this these psalms and and uh, passages that have to do with the nurturing God and and unconditional love and all of these really feminine aspects that are are endemic in in the in the original script, but you have to go back to the original to get that kind of um, ambiguity. And I think because we live in a patriarchal culture, that just becomes invisible to us. Yeah. So it's kind of a surprise to think about God in feminine terms. And it turns out, oh, that's the way it was written to begin with. Yeah. That, that is, I think, one of many, many, many problems with most of the English translations. Um, we understand Hebrew a lot better now than we ever have. Um, and um, there were so many ways, storytelling methods. And uh, I, I pointed out just one of them here, the and, 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 and. Thing last time that we talked, but the Hebrews had a lot of ways of telling their stories that do not come across in the English translations for the most part. Um, and there are, I, I could give you a whole list of problems uh, that the English translations have. Um, one of the more recent ones that I really like is Robert Alter, uh, his uh, translation. He's done the entire Hebrew uh, Bible. Uh, you can buy it in different parts, or you can buy it as a, a whole. Um, but um, he uh, actually brings a lot of the Hebrew storytelling and rhythm, and uh, you know, the, the clearly you can see that these had oral storytelling origins. I mean, they they just drive you. They drive you physically uh, when you actually understand how they told these stories. It's really interesting. And, yeah, I, I just like lose so sorry. I think I just want to oh. go ahead, Joss. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let's battle it out here. No. Uh yeah, we, we have you know, John, it just shows that, you know, you've you know, stirred up um a lot of interest in this topic, especially about women in the um the old testament. And uh because we're we have now a lively discussion. Um Tim, you know, you're absolutely correct this whole um, making women invisible, a lot of had to, was stemmed from politics. And probably um, men at that time were, well, there was a patriarch patriarchic society. So they felt intimidated and threatened by women's um, power, wisdom, and just uh, a lot of the abilities that perhaps they lacked but didn't realize that you know, that uh, they needed women to make it whole. Um, and Maxie, I just wanted to, you know, thank you for your, you know, tremendous knowledge and bringing that to the yeah. forefront. You're just a walking encyclopedia. And I just have to, you know, 
give kudos and thank you so much, you know, namaste brother for bringing <laughs> up all the little details here to enrich um, yeah. John's uh, lecture. And um, Skip, you're absolutely right. There's problems with um, lost in translation and, um, you yeah, know, with the terminology sure. and labels and so forth. But, but now we're moving into the new times and um, John bringing this to the forefront and bringing this discussion with a bunch of men and women together. This is like very, very cool. This is what's needed in these times. You know, the feminine um, energy, the divine feminine needs to be brought forth um, um, more, I don't want to say forcefully, but more affirmatively. And men need to help with this. Okay. We Absolutely. Need, we need you guys, all right, yeah. to bring it out um, to the, um, the, uh, the collective unconscious because right now there's an imbalance, as you can see, that's going on in this, you know, world. So I just wanted to, you know, compliment this whole, you know, panel right here and, and John for being the catalyst for bringing this subject up. Thank you. Yeah, there's, uh, there, I just want to point out that there are nine women of the 14 panelists, nine are women here, <laughs> which, which is terrific. And, uh, and some of you are, are book writers, so some of you might think in terms of uh, pulling some, some books together uh, on these topics. I know Susan Scott has done. Uh, maybe there's another book there, Susan, <laughs> or more than one. We're all frozen up. Mm -hmm. Well, I wanted to add on, on the tail of what Josh said that I'm trying to make myself really aware of the difference between what I think of as history and history, which is the, the part of history that doesn't come down to us through the oral tradition. And I have to try to imagine what is missing. Like, for instance, um, I think about Martin Luther's Martin Luther King's speech on the steps of the Lincoln Memorial. His "I Have a Dream" speech, which feels to me like one of these monumental pieces of storytelling. That thank God we have film so that we can listen to him and watch his face as he tells as he delivers this speech. But think about what that sounds like if you have the speech printed out and you hit, hit the button on your computer that will read the text. And it seems to me that that's what reading the Old Testament, in fact, any kind of scripture is. It's the, it's the logos left brain, um, calcification of certain words that were said in a certain order. And so you miss all of the emotion and the expression and the body language. And if you think about any great storyteller, so much of it is drama and suspense and timing and all those things that you just cannot, uh, cannot put into words. So I, I always try to keep that in mind that, oh, this, we're only getting a percentage of what of what the real wisdom is here. John, I'm wondering about the different groups of Jewish uh, beliefs or like conservative or liberal or however you say that, <clears throat> how they treat women or how their approach and relationship with women are. How does it vary? I don't really fully know the answer to that question. Um, is anyone else here more familiar with Jewish culture than I am? Uh, I'm, I'm not a, an authority on uh, Jewish culture, but I will say that uh, oftentimes the word patriarchal is used in a negative sense. 
and I would point out that the family unit has always been of vital importance within Jewish culture. That Jewish fathers, husbands, brothers, cousins have loved their feminine counterparts. They've endured persecution with them. They've endured dispersion to all parts of the world. And they did not abandon them uh, when they went to the gas chambers. And they didn't get any slack from their German male gender counterparts either. Uh, there is no great patriarchal plot. I'd also point out that in the King James Bible, which is one of the standard Protestant Bibles, that Sophia appears in there. Uh, I don't know of any evidence that there is a an organized conspiracy among uh, Protestants uh, or Catholics or any other Christian group that I'm aware of uh, that wants to somehow get rid of Sophia and get rid of the feminine. And then also an argument can be made in the United States that the United States is a matriarchal country. Uh, but in the end, I don't know that makes a difference. We're all, uh, we should try to grow beyond uh, gender and think of each other as uh, human beings in their totality. There's well, a lot they, with, um, with Orthodox Jews um, with the separation where they couldn't sit in the same side of the synagogue together. There was the male side and the female side. Um, the, the women had to co cover up their hair um, when they got married. There were a lot of rules. Um, I, I was just watching, I forgot what movie it was, something about Orthodox, um, unorthodox, I think it was. It was a four part TV show or a Netflix show that was wonderful about um, uh, th this woman that was, um, grew up in an Orthodox family and I forgot what, what years it took place. Um, and all the things she couldn't do. She couldn't sing when she was growing up. Singing was, was part of the male tradition. And, and um, so th there's, well, there was a lot of separation in the Orthodox. Well, there's a lot of separation around. I think even in Quaker meetings, uh, men and women are separated. And, um, and just to take exception a little bit, Maxie, um, I have a King James Version in front of me, and in Proverbs 8, it refers to wisdom. It doesn't refer to Sophia. Um, and but they were, syn they were synonyms. Yeah, but, but who knows that? I didn't know that until, uh, until I read Edinger. I mean, I, I acknowledge that also in the, in the New Jerusalem Bible or the or the Jerusalem Bible, it also says wisdom, but one of these Bibles I have it, it says I Sophia instead of I, I wisdom. Um, it does, it does say uh, I wisdom and mid mistress. That's it. I, I'm not saying that this is a, um, is a conspiracy. Um, but, um, but here in, in, in the New Jerusalem Bible, uh, which is the Catholic Bible, it says, I wisdom am mistress of discretion. But in the, uh, in the King James Version, it says, I wisdom dwell with prudence and find out knowledge of witty inventions. But, and at the beginning of the Proverbs 8, it says, uh, doth not wisdom cry and understanding put forth her voice? Okay, so that does take on a feminine gender. Well, Skip is frozen again. Anyway, in Robert Alter's uh, translation, wisdom is not, uh, is, she's called wisdom, but it's clearly a woman, uh, but not called Sophia. Well, this is where it seems to me it's helpful to have all these different translations because they each bring out different uh, yeah. perspectives on the same. In text. Thank you, John, very much. I've read the New Testament from beginning to end, but I have not done the same with the Old Testament. 
I'll spend some time going through all of these the series several times, and I'll be really primed to read the Old Testament. Um, one of uh, my favorite Calvinist pastors, uh, Paul Vanderclay, recently taught me that in the Old Testament, there's um, statements that to men that the penalty for harming a woman is death. And uh, I, I'm, I haven't taken time to go researching the number of instances that that's made, but I think it'll be very instructional for me to read that. I think it'll be instructional to share that with my teenage son and teenage daughter. And uh, just wondering if you recall coming across such statements that the penalty for harming a woman is death. I, I can't think of where that is, but I'm sure it's true. Um, they also had very strict rules about slaves. Um, you could not abuse them, and you could only own them for so long, depending on who they were. And you had to offer them freedom. And uh, uh, so I wouldn't be surprised at all. I can't think of the place that you're referring to, but I believe it. Yeah. Thank you. Looks like Skip's coming back. Skip, turn off your camera. It might help. <laughs> Well, it looks to me like maybe we're winding down. So, John, are you uh, willing to come back and give us more? I'd be happy to do it. Uh, Skip was going to talk to me about what subject. Um, there's a lot to choose from. It'd be interesting to talk about the English translations. Um, I have a whole section in one of my lectures about that. Um, but I'll talk with Skip and we'll come up with something. Okay. Well, this... This, everything you're presenting is just so fascinating, and I'm sure we all appreciate it. This discussion is so lively and so... Yeah, I love the discussion. 